Thank you. Um, just a reminder, this is November. And so at this time, this weekend anyway, um, Find My Past has um, a lot of military records that are available to look at for free of charge, uh, plus some other things. And this time of the year, you know, when we're on one of these holidays is usually when these companies try to gain more membership and um, sell subscriptions, et cetera. And so you want to be keeping a lookout between now and now for the, the uh, Veterans Day stuff, and then Thanksgiving will be coming. And so sometimes they'll put up things, Mayflower Research or Pilgrims, or, you know, you know, keep that in mind as we go through the holiday season. Okay. Um, uh, our main presenter today is James Tanner, and he's also our presenter for the second hour. And this is his bio in a nutshell. James has over 40 years of experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of the Genealogy Star blog uh, and others. Okay, He has served as a family history volunteer for over 18 years and presented at expos and conferences around the U.S., Canada, and Europe. He's a member of the board of directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is an attorney, a professional photographer, has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. So you got page one of the pedigree chart pretty well covered there, I guess. Okay. His presentation, first presentation, will be on the impact of artificial intelligence and genealogy. And this is really a big deal right now. So we all need to learn as much as we can about how to make the best use of this uh, new tool, or should I say tools, uh, artificial intelligence, AI, you may have heard it referred to, has been getting a lot of media attention lately. Overall, AI is developing so rapidly that when you see that what you see and how you interact online is changing exponentially. Advancements like chat, GPT-4, DAL, E2, self-driving cars, natural language processing are transforming the AI landscape because genealogy is a subject that's highly dependent on information. Um, we should be able to learn a lot today about how and why uh, this AI is impacting genealogy from the implementation of handwriting recognition to indexing and beyond. So, all right. Um, thank you, James, for being here, and we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Just get sharing here. Okay, well, as Laurie mentioned, we're going to talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on genealogy. And I put the word updated on this because, um, for instance, of the things that uh, uh, Laurie read off about programs and such, the, there was one called Dall E, it's D A L L E. And uh, she said 2.0, and it's now at 3.0 in just about a week or so. So, um, you know, it's really um, a fast moving and very interesting topic to get into. Um, and first, I guess it's important to understand a little bit. Uh, we can't get into too much detail in an hour, but it's important to understand what it is. It's a field of computer science that is involved in creating systems that can independently perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence and intervention, or that involve large scale data beyond human capacity. So it's kind of two things uh, that are being worked on here. One is the massive amount of information that's available uh, currently uh, online and being added to by the billions and billions of records every day. It's just a, a massive amount of information, um, almost unimaginable. And it, what happens is that uh, it, accessing and utilizing and understanding and even having a way to visualize that kind of massive amount of information is uh, one of the great, uh, I guess, things that great challenges right now of our, of our human existence. And uh, the addition to that, we want to be able to do that in a way that makes it accessible to people, uh, let's say directly, 
And that's kind of the, one of the goals of artificial intelligence. Now, there's a lot of people who have talked about it um, that for a long time, that somehow or another, there's uh, uh, that this is kind of new, it's an invasion, it's something that just happened, and and uh, we need to be concerned about it, and on and on and on. So there's a lot of news coming out right now. But what's happened really is that um, this idea that machines, including computers, could take over some of the tasks done by humans just been around for, for a decade, for hundreds of years. Uh, the first one of these that caused quite a stir was in 1786, uh, an English inventor named Edmund, Car Edmund Cartwright uh, patented the first power loom. And perhaps if you know a little bit about English history, you'll recognize the name Luddites. Um, and this is uh, a depiction of uh, the leader of the Luddites. This was published in May of 1812. Um, the idea here was that there were lots of weavers, home weavers, people who were weaving their weaving cloth in their homes and making some money out of that. Along came these mechanical looms, and they could output anybody on their on a loom, uh, and uh, and actually took uh, perhaps dozens of workers out of out of business and with one loom. And so this was a major thing, and uh, the Luddites were uh, upset enough with that that they organized and they would attack the factories and just try to destroy the looms as if that would prevent this from uh, the progress from happening. And in a sense, that's there's Luddites today. There are people who see still see whatever new uh, development is out there, particularly in, with things like AI that are a little bit strange and hard to hard to understand as a threat. And uh, the answer is mm, yes. And as a matter of fact, it is going to be a threat because the way we do things and the way things happen is going to change. And uh, your job or your, your interest may be uh, in a sense eliminated from, from uh, the long, long, long list of of uh, various skills and employments and, and opportunities that have uh, disappeared over the years since the Industrial Revolution began in full at about 1830. In England, actually, is where we measure it having begun because 1830 is the date in which uh, England began the first commercial railroad operations. And that is uh, the, uh, one major measure of the uh, of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So what we have today are people who are losing their jobs, just like wagon wheel makers and, and stagecoach drivers and uh, other people have lost their uh, telephone operators, for example, ex except for some very narrow areas. So there's just lots of different things that uh, will be and are being affected only on a much let's call it a more dramatic and more rapid area. So things are going to be changing in the, in the, um, uh, in the future, and it's uh, undoubtedly going to affect more and more and more people. But despite some of the more import, of the important negative issues this, that are being discussed, that uh, Genealogical research will benefit uh, immensely on um, because of these new developments in artificial intelligence. And, and I'm going to explain a little bit about all of that. Now, during the second hour of the class, uh, I'm going to be demonstrating uh, a half a dozen or so programs that you might have heard of and things you might have heard of, and some of the things that I'll talk about here. So we'll have some uh, actual online uh, present, uh, you know, demos of these various different programs. Uh, that will happen in real time. So I mean, uh, it's not like I'm going to be able to speed up the process. So we may have a little bit of intervals while we watch the screen do its th uh, computer program do its thing and and create the image or, or whatever is going to happen. So just uh, might be aware that the second hour will 
involved with all of these demonstrations. Um, but think about, and we have to think about this, how far we've come already. Um, in my own experience, since I have uh, been doing genealogies uh, for 40, over 42 years now, um, I go way back before there were computers um, and stuff when I started. So I have the experience of being a fully paper genealogist, uh, adding all of my information being gathered from paper records and or books, which are both paper records, I guess. And um, it took me, and, and this is the process because I realized I needed to know what had already been done, um, that I've been involved in research and libraries and all of that my whole life. And so uh, always the first thing I did whenever I started a research project was I needed to do a review to see what was available and what wasn't available. And in this case, what was available in genealogy consisted of all of the records that have been produced previously. So uh, that was what I needed to do. And to do that at that time, I had to go to the Salt Lake City Family History Library, now called the Salt the Family History, the Salt Lake City Family Search Library, to do a survey. And uh, that was a survey of family group records uh, for my own family. And this took me 15 years and ended up with about a three foot high stack of copied family group records. And during that time is when computers were actually be becoming more common and I acquired a, a, my original Apple II computer and then my Apple II e computer and um, was started putting that information into various computer programs uh, such as personal ancestral file, which was developed quite early during that time period. And so all of those things ha began happening at the same time. And uh, because of I had a rather extensive background in, in uh, computers and computer usage, I was able to uh, get right into there and begin doing that. And I'm still doing it, and I'm still finding the information, and I'm still correcting everything that everyone else put in the family tree, and, and we're going on with what's happening today. Uh, but that 15 years, because of programs like the Family Search Family Tree, uh, I could do that same search in a matter of days or weeks. And I could also save uh, a lot of quarters for copies because I had to pay for each of the copies that I made. So, you know, the, the time compression is, is kind of what happens here. Tasks that took us um, days, months, weeks, years in the past can now be done in a matter of even minutes or, or days or weeks today. One good example of this, by the way, is the recent... Uh, uh, um, adaptation or or uh, research or building of the index for the uh, 1950 U.S. Census, which came out this year. And uh, the 1950 census basically um, was much, much more extensive because of increase in population over the 1940 census. And Ancestry, in conjunction with Family Surge, began the process of doing the 1940 census back when it came out. And that took about six months for them to process uh, that particular, um, that set of data. That meant they indexed the process through digitizing. Of course, the digital records were made available by the uh, National Archives. And then they were able to, to use optical character recognition to um, to start the process of, of looking through the whole and indexing the whole uh, census. And then um, that process basically with a lot of volunteers, hundreds, thousands actually of volunteers from Family Search, uh, took about six months. Well, this year, when the, when the uh, 1950 census was ma made available, it took Ancestry eight hours to index the entire census records. And then it took a matter of only about a month or so for 
the um, review of that information to validate what had been done by the computer. And that was due to handwriting recognition, and I'll talk about a little bit more about that in just a minute. But this is the kind of thing that we we can start to see has uh, not a sort of a hypothetical or speculative kind of, oh, it may affect you in this way. This is something that directly affected me and everyone else that was uh, working on the 19, uh, who needed to look at or was going to use the 1950 census for a uh, for, for references. Now, let's kind of understand a little more about a, artificial intelligence or AI, and I'll just call it AI because rather than saying the whole sentence, well, I make a note here that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, sort of disingenuous. It's it's not a good term. It does not a good descriptive term. It's not even um, it's not even really something that was accurate. Uh, there's nothing artificial about it. There's nothing that's nothing doesn't really deal with intelligence. It deals with computer programming, and a better name would be enhanced computer programming. Of course, that doesn't have the kind of emotional attack feel that uh, artificial intelligence has. But okay, so there's lots of different parts of AI, and it helps to understand what these are. Uh, I can't explain all of them in detail, but I can kind of tell you what it is. Cognitive computing means that the computer can learn from uh, the input. And computer vision is what we're looking at here is an image that's created by the computer Machine learning, uh, another part of the process that goes along with cognitive computing, meaning cognitive gives it the, the, the way to adapt, and machine learning means you can teach it using the, the adaption methods. And neural networks mean we're trying to uh, visualize how the human brain works and then simulate or, or model the human brain and, and uh, make your computer work the same way and make the same kinds of connections. And deep learning gives the computer the, uh, the uh, ability to uh, learn in more than just superficially, not as just a lookup. It's not something that you're just looking up, but it's actually looking into the meaning and substance of whatever it is and whatever's involved in the process. And natural language processing means that just exactly that, that it takes what people can say, like I'm saying right now, or any written piece of material in any language and, and be able to understand and process that. Um, uh, for instance, translate from one language to another, for example, and other examples of what it is. Fuzzy logic gives the computer, the uh, programmers are able to have the computer guess in other words, it can make the best guess for a certain amount of information, but because it has a way of examining more and more information, then that the guesses become more accurate and more accurate until they are um, more reliable than, um, than, than they would be otherwise. And expert systems. Some of these are actually overlapping terms. They don't really have a, a strict meaning in the sense that they are they're absolutely tagged to something that somebody's doing. In fact, no one agrees on the number of, of items in this list, and no one agrees on the names of the of the items in the list. And every time I look this up, I get a different number and I get a different bunch of names as the major subfields. So um, it's 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 a rapidly changing environment they can't even agree on what they're talking about oh and the last one i forgot to add is robotics which uh, by the way is probably the most um uh, uh, let's say astonishing and uh and one that threatens more people than almost anything else so let's just kind of jump ahead uh, not jump ahead to to what has been done in um, to implement AI and genealogy. What are the areas that we're already uh, been working on? And I might put it as as far as decades. In other words, we're not talking about something that happened in the last year. We're talking about things that have been ongoing for 
for 10 to 20 years back. And the first is handwriting recognition. Um, I've been watching this for many years and, and um, one of the major uh, organizations that was looking into handwriting recognition was the BYU Family History Technology Lab. At the, and uh, every year I would be, at least every year I would check and, uh, and more frequently in the uh, near past about how they were developing and what I could do to help. And sometimes there were some things that I could do by doing some research and providing them with information. But ultimately what happened and coalesced in about the last two or three years is that handwriting recognition moved into the forefront because uh, the ability to recognize text, including old German uh, handwriting and almost every other type of handwriting in the world, uh, just exceeded the accuracy level of human um, translators or human indexers. So when you're talking about handwriting recognition, you're talking about something that's now available and, and very, very much used. And in our case, uh, there's some other things, the computer aided indexing, which they call CAI. Uh, this has become available more um, since we have some uh, enhanced uh, optical character recognition where uh, printed text can be recognized by the computer. And, and then we, when we moved into having handwriting recognition and computer-aided indexing became a big deal, uh, it's more complicated in some senses, uh, some situations than uh, the handwriting recognition itself. It, because it involves having to identify where on the page certain things appear and uh, how to how to index them and how we pick out the names, how you pick out the relationships, how you pick out all of the other information that's contained. So uh, that has also been been going on for many years. And now the handwriting recognition with computer-aided indexing is being occurred. And organizations like Family Search, are using that to digitize millions of records. Uh, I get a notice uh, periodically from Family Search about the number of new indexed records, usually running into the hundreds or thousands in, a, in any given set of records. And now I'm getting records that say two or three million in a matter of a week. And so the process here is going to be is going to have a dramatic impact on what's going on in, in uh, genealogy. And of course, we have another area, computer vision and image gem generation. Um, this a little bit more, a uh, little kind of esoteric here as to whether it will impact genealogy, but when we begin to see how it's being uh, used, and I'll just go through that in just a few minutes here, uh, you can see that this is going to, to make a tremendous addition, addition. And facial recognition, which goes on along with the computer vision, vision portion. Um, all of this is going to make a big, a lot of big difference to um, how genealogists do their work, particularly with those who are adding visual images like photographs of their ancestors to, to certain collections. And then of course there's natural language translation. This has been going on for some many years now as far as uh, various computer programs that were translating, but now it's instantaneously translated into hundreds of languages simultaneously. So it's, you can, some of the newest things that have come out just in this last week is that um, the, uh, Adobe, uh, the uh, big computer company, computer program company has come out with a process where they can edit uh, a video, say you do a video in, in English and uh, you want to have it in a number of different languages, uh, they can then take the voice of the person who is speaking in English and using that same voice, translate uh, the program into dozens of different languages without it making any, any mistakes as to significant mistakes. So, uh, you can hear yourself speaking German, French, Spanish, whatever it is, 
as uh, as they do this automatically. And then there's a, a another part of this, which is not natural language processing, not the same thing. We're not translating it into another language. What we're doing here is what comes out of the programs that they now call chat programs. And natural language programming depend, processing depends on huge databases, uh, billions and billions and billions of records that are examined, and uh, all of the information and the uh, word patterns and associates and meanings of everything is that is is analyzed and trained into the computer, and then the computer is able to use that to um, respond to questions, and that's what's happening. And just, just as some examples here, you may have been using AI programs for, for quite some time and not even realized that you were using an AI program. And uh, obviously, you're not afraid of it. I'm, I mean, I don't see anybody cringing in fear from record hints, for example, in this case. Um, the, the record hints that you see on the major programs on family search and ancestry and find my past and, and my heritage and other programs and other um, desktop programs and things that have record hints all comes about as, as a result of using AI to, uh, to make a program that goes through uh, the database that's on the uh, program on the website, for example, on family search here and go through all their records and uh, build a, uh, a description of all those records and then matches those record hints to uh, individuals when we have sufficient information. So as long as you put information in about a person, <clears throat> you should have some record hints. Um, one other one is DNA matching. Uh, when you go on to and take a DNA test and are um, uh, given a, an ethnicity estimate and are given DNA matches, all of that comes about because the programs that are based on artificial intelligence using the different components of artificial intelligence that I kind of outlined. And if my descriptions were fuzzy, it's because the descriptions of all these are turn out to be very fuzzy and con sometimes contradictory. Now, there's other things, too, because computer vision and facial recognition has been used. And the, the major leader in this is MyHeritage. And there are two programs that have come out just recently. One is they're called a photo dater. And what that will do is it will look at your photos and give you an estimate of when that photograph was taken. Um, and it's it's really accurate. And I've tried it out on a number of uh, photographs, and uh, it gives you a very good estimate of the time frame based on the thousands and thousands of, of images that they trained this uh, program how to use it. And the other one on here is, that I've highlighted is called Photo Tagger. And what that does is it goes through and looks through um, the, your database of photos of how many photos you have and says all these people are probably the same people. And if they are, then you can go click, click, click and tag those photos without having to look for them each individually. And if not, then you can say no, 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 no. And uh, then the program will uh, learn a little bit more from what you've just done. And both of these are, are in programs that are available in right in MyHeritage. And some of these are available to MyHeritage users even when they don't have a subscription. But mo most of them are subscription part of the subscription program. Now, I spoke a moment ago about the computer, about handwriting recognition and the indexing part of it. So now what, uh, to kind of reinforce that, uh, what I explained just a moment ago, Family Search has uses artificial intelligence to scan hard, handwritten genealogical documents, millions of them, and generate an index from the names and other information from the documents. And it's not perfect. And to help uh, get the, uh, to make the information more correct, there's, uh, we've been doing uh, human-based indexing. That hasn't gone away yet. It, it, uh, I mean, I would be, not be hard to predict that it will go away in, in sometime in the future. 
but right now there's still human-based indexing out there. But on this computer indexing, then there's get involved for, for volunteers to help with that. So on familysearch.org, on the menu bar, get involved, uh, there's indexing and then there's name review. Name review is the process of looking at what, what uh, the, in the handwriting recognition program in, on Family Search has recognized. So this top name in blue is, has been read by the computer as Alvarado. And uh, I look at it, and yes, it's correct. So all I would have to do at this point is go down to the green button at the bottom and click match. Um, and this is tremendously faster than doing indexing because basically you're saying you don't know or you can read it and you don't, uh, and it's not correct, and here's what's correct and or what. And what's what you're doing on this is you're training the computer because every one you do, gives it one more incremental instance of how to read the, all of this different handwriting and the way it is done. And when I mentioned a moment ago is accelerated OCR. That's optical character recognition. That's the, what you do. You can take a sheet of text and have the, a program that does optical characterization which by the way is just a multitude of programs now online, everything from Microsoft Word to uh, documents in, uh, uh, in, on Google to just about every other program has, a lot of programs out there now have uh, OCR technology, which means you can take any printed material and turn it into a text file and be able to manipulate the text on your computer. But one of the things that's happening here is this is on Ancestry, and Ancestry now has the, the capability of um, doing this in an advanced way, accelerated way, and with more accuracy. And as a result, they're on their way to adding more than 15 billion completely indexed records this year. They're, they're now in that process of doing that, and they'll be adding 15 billion records. So this is like... Uh, uh, summary for the last month or so, uh, last two or three months actually, of uh, records that have been digitized and uh, added to their collections, newly added to their collections. So they're either updated or new, and um, they're well on their way to the, to the 15 billion individual records. Uh, another thing that uh, that uh, Family Search is using is computer generated trees. This is in the genealogy section of the of the search tab in on FamilySearch.org, and and uh, I'm finding that a lot of people haven't clicked there and don't look at it, maybe casually, and then say, "Well, I don't know what that is," and and kind of ignore it. But in this case, uh, one of them with moderate data act accuracy, not high yet. Um, and not unknown, but uh, very helpful is that using the handwriting recognition and the, the computer-aided indexing, and then taking it a step further, and once those names and, and information have been identified and, and uh, uh, ingested by the computer so that they can uh, use them, then the third step was let's look at this and have the computer put together a family tree. So let's see what that how that happens. So here's the list of the trees that have been generated so far. You can see uh, that there's trees with um, like the one for Argentina that has almost 10 or more than 9 million uh, original people in it. And, and then the computer has generated family trees for all of those 9 million people. So for here, this one's from Mexico, and uh, you can see that, that you can go search this, and, and it's had more than 10 million records uh, of the people that lived in Nuevo León, which is a Mexican state. And uh, then you can look and search to see if the computer has put that together in um, a family tree. So I just took a, a surname or random, and then I put that in as a search, and I came up with 36,000 people with that last that name, that surname. 
And then I chose one at random. And uh, this is the family tree that Family Search has created for that person. Now, it may not, it, it still has not removed the human element here because you need to have looked at the records. But the important part about this is it's also supported by all the records. So as you go in there, it will give you an opportunity to review and see if this is correct. But the initial a compilation of this is done by the computer, and so it's able, it's available for uh, for entry into the family tree once it's been uh, reviewed and um, processed. So now we get into some things that aren't that are that don't seem to be related directly, but will have a, a tremendous impact uh, ultimately on genealogy and every other uh, information based pursuit around the world. So what we're looking at here is an image that was generated uh, from Bing's DALI. Uh, now, Bing is part of Microsoft, and um, Microsoft has uh, put itself in the forefront of the major players in the AI uh, developments that are ongoing. And so what we're looking at here is, a, this is not a photograph. It did not involve a camera at all. It, it involved me describing this scene uh, to uh, Bing's implementation of DAL-E, which is an image generation program. And it happens to be DAL-E 3. And as a photographer, um, this is, almost exactly what you would see. It would be difficult, not difficult to figure out that it was generated, but it would be, if, if you were just looking at it, you wouldn't even think, you wouldn't even identify this as a, as a generated photo. And then you can take the same photo as, or AI generated image and put it into Adobe Photoshop and then ask Adobe, Adobe Photoshop to take that smaller image and add additional information to it to match perfectly what was in the original image generated. So this was a secondary image generation that took my first image that I created. Go back to that to see. And then turned it into a more panorama image. And then this image can be further processed and uh, through another Adobe program called Lightroom, you can go in and increase the resolution, which means you can pump this up to the point where uh, it would be the same resolution as a high resolution camera um, into the you know, above 30 and 40 megapixel type pictures. So there's really, from a use standpoint, there's no difference between this and a, an actual photograph. Will it put photography out of business? Well, the answer to that is certainly not. But uh, on the other hand, the main use that I use this for is uh, as I do my presentations like this one, I need uh, images and uh, I can go look online for public domain images. Uh, since it would break my budget to go out there and try to purchase all of the images I use, the thousands of images I use over the course of a year. And so uh, now I can use these programs to generate images. And then these images, as has been decided recently by the court, are not subject to copyright. And uh, so I have no problem uh, using them, especially since I generated it through the program. Uh, I should have what I want. Now, my heritage has uh, used the same uh, type of program, uh, this image generation program, to uh, take take movies and uh, the video and uh, actually um, has put those into, um, let me just check here for a second and see that I've got this. ready to go. So let's hope that this comes through. But what they've done is they've it basically, you can take a photograph with the AI time machine and turn it into 
uh, someone that looks like a different generation. You may have seen this happening, uh, but this is where it originated with uh, a with uh, my heritage, and now it's starting to move across the uh, internet into other programs. And deep stories makes your ancestor speak. So uh, let's see if this comes across. Hopefully, it will. Hi, I'm Eva Margaret Overson. Here is what I would like you to remember about me. I was born on August 14, 1897, in St. John's. My father Henry Christian Overson was born in 1868, in USA. My mother Margaret Godfrey Jarvis was born in 1878, in USA. When they married in 1890. Hi. Okay, well, that was enough of that, but that kind of image generation and audio and making the animation effect there is kind of spooky, uh, but uh, on and it's available to people who are who registered on on my heritage, basically, and it's um, and it's completely editable. You can write the script to it. So you can have and put in any of the images that you want to write. So and then download that actually as a as a movie, a video file that will will run on your computer. So you could create something like that out of my heritage, uh, where one of your ancestors or many of your ancestors narrated their life stories and uh, make those available to your uh, uh, children, grandchildren, or to other people, other relatives. Now what we have is what's called natural language uh, translation. Um, you can actually use your smartphone um, like that uh, to translate whatever you see. Or if you're walking around, for instance, you're walking around on a vacation in some country in Europe or someplace where the language, like language you do not know is spoken or anytime you come in contact with something in a language you don't understand. You can use Google's uh, program right now. It works right out of the, out of the photos uh, parts of your, um, your smartphone. During the second hour of this, pro of this um, presentation, I'm going to do some demonstrations of that. But if you go to your, uh, if you have it, you have to implement that uh, as an app from your Google account on your smartphone, smartphone. And then uh, once it's set up, when you have a photograph up, it will show a little box in the lower right-hand corner. And whenever you point your camera at a text that uh, is in a different language, uh, it will give you yellow brackets on the sides of the text. And then if you touch the button at the bottom at the same time, I mean, you have to have enough coordination to do this, which from the video that I'll show you, you can tell I don't have. And uh, when you click on that, then it will do the trans, it will take a picture of it essentially and then translate it into uh, whatever, into your English, into what the language you want to speak or whatever you want to, want to translate it to. Um, the second, Part of this, and which I will also demonstrate in the second hour, is that you can take an AI document. Now you can take a document like this. Um, this is a will, um, a deed. I'm sorry. This is a deed that was um, uh, that I found transcribed online from uh, one of my relatives to another relative to another person, not my relative. And so what you could do to re what you need to do is create an abstract of this. And in, in other words, um, extract the relevant information from the deed and read through it and do that. And so what I did was I copied this into Microsoft Bing chat. It will take up to 4,000 characters, which is a pretty big document. And then basically what um, you do is say, give me a summary of this document. And so 
when that happens, then uh, it, a few seconds later, it gave me this outline summary of what was uh, what had happened with this particular document and identified the people and gave the dates. And there's further things that you can do. You can have them, ex the, the chat will extract all the names and put them into a, to a uh, format of a, of a table, like a, an Excel document. And then you can use that Excel table to an further analyze or a, a tablet a table format to analyze the information that's in in the record and it does it in a few seconds instead of very painfully going through and recording all this information and trying to figure out who all these people are so now we're to the point of knowing what coming what's coming in ai and it's very quick here because the things that i expect are a tremendous expansion of the indexed searchable records, uh, individual customized AI assistants or co-pilots for research. I can't demonstrate all of this because this stuff isn't going to doesn't exist yet, except in some forms. Co-pilots are starting to come out right now. Uh, the expansion of the index and searchable records is coming out through Ancestry right now, and more computer generated family trees may or may not be coming from family search we that hasn't been settled yet augmented information gathering is going to obviously be adapted by everyone uh, doing any kind of data research so you won't have very long to wait for these things because they're in the process today and it's very possible that they would be um, uh, brought out in the next few weeks and I would expect to see that kind of change on a on a less than six month level. So if you're going to be here, stay tuned for the second hour for the demos of some of the current AI implemented programs. And um, uh, I will get to those when we get to that point. So thank you for listening and thanks for watching. Can we ask some questions? Yes, I was just coming on here. Does anybody have any at the moment? Well, we're going to go into the second hour and answer a lot of questions. That'll be the first okay. item of business. So it'll probably be whatever you need to do between that, because since we've come up to 11 o'clock about. So. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, we good. Uh, 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 James, one of the things that occurred to me while you were talking is you mentioned that AI is a, not a good term, and I agree with you. It isn't art, nothing artificial and nothing to do with intelligence. And I thought, well, what would and you you commented on a couple of new ideas that would would be better terminology. It occurred to me that what this is is this is an automated scientific method. The scientific mm -hmm. method just experiments to try different things, and if it doesn't work, you scrap it and you start with something else. But this is an automated way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. That's it's it's very much a trial and error. Um, it it re yeah. does require. Mm -hmm. It's hard to express how much information is, uh, how much training, and time and effort it takes to get this to work yeah. in the first place. So it's not something yeah. that automatically occurs, and it's it's more, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's 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 very labor intensive initially and then the labor is transferred to the computer and and but there's no it's a cumulative effect because the yeah. first labor of course would be gathering huge yep. a huge uh, mm -hmm. record sets the the um the, the labor intensive of doing that but then once they're there they're there and you use them and, you, and then you can automate the process through using the programs that you're developing, then you also develop the way to automate what you're doing, and that is facilitated by the programs themselves. Right. So what? Yeah. One thing I didn't mention, of course, because it doesn't really have anything to do with genealogy, is from a, a user standpoint, is that um, programs that in programming that this AI assisted 
uh, can li uh, help write programs in all the different programming languages. It, it actually codes the programs. So you're going to see new programs developed because it, they've been able to get AI much faster to develop the, uh, the, the code. So. That's phenomenal. Uh, we're looking forward to the second half of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. And um, I think so I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. So now you're on. Oh, okay. Um, thanks. And um, yeah, there's a lot to think about. I'm, I'm excited about a lot of the things that are happening. And I have questions, but I'll, t I'll save them for the second hour. Um, so uh, thanks very much for doing this class for us and getting our attention about AI. i like to thank my husband, Jerry, who was not scheduled to um, run this pro program today, but stepped in at the last moment when Gary had had a, some kind of a, an emergency that he needed to attend to. Um, and so we'll see you in about five minutes. We're going to end this presentation and we'll be back online in five minutes with um, Facebook.